And according to the Washington Examiner, they published this in February 2023, we're also living in a country when the State Department funded the Global Disinformation Index. I know you know this, but this mm -hmm. is a British entity that has been blacklisting and working to defund conservative media. How did we get here and how did this happen so fast? What are your insights on all this? You know, I, I think there were three events that kind of shocked the um, so-called elite establishment, which is the the insiders of media, government, and, and academics. And those, those three events were something called Brexit that was a vote in Europe where the UK voters kind of shocked their establishment and government elites by voting to actually exit the European Union partly because of its many rules on immigration and, and general government by bureaucracy rather than by elected officials. And the second big event, which was clearly the earthquake, was Trump winning the election in 2016, which deeply shocked both political parties' establishment and especially the insiders of our government, media institutions, you know, kind of the East Coast establishment, if you will. And so this, uh, you know, this created a, a big increase in, you know, looking to find a scapegoat or to blame. They ended up blaming uh, Facebook, you know, for enabling Trump to win. And then there was a third thing that isn't as well known, but I think also was influential. And that was an episode called Climate Gate, where the academics uh, were shocked to find out that many of their own most famous climate scientists were purposefully misleading the public and blocking studies by other scientists who had different results or different opinions about climate alarmism, whether it's right or wrong. So these three episodes shocked, you know, our media, academic and government institutions. And, you know, how could how could Trump win 70 million votes? And they started making up a lot of crazy stories, you know, Russia Gate that assumed Russia and Putin were somehow controlling Trump and his campaign. You know, we, as you mentioned, we see now the U.S. government and the U.K. government as well, you know, funding efforts by some academic groups, the Atlantic Council, a group at Stanford called the Internet Observatory and, and some other groups at the University of Washington to kind of outsource the idea of censorship and influencing what the citizens are able to read and as you said to think by what they read online and a whole network of mom and pop kind of liberal media fact checkers became an industry you know led by these media institutions to jawbone and influence the facebook google twitter the social media platforms to censor certain types of inconvenient content and, and even to ban, you know, some writers and content producers who, you know, regularly disagreed with whatever the current consensus narrative might be, you know, from our government and, and media. Um, and so what, what happens is all these efforts um, get in trouble because basically they're trying to arbitrate for all the rest of us, you know, which information is true and which is false. Um, just to throw in there, why is that a problem? So you hear these arguments out there hey i support free speech i just don't want misinformation or disinformation what would your response to that argument be well the simple response is who decides mm -hmm. um you know the social media platforms have worked very hard and i think have done a good job to eliminate many types of harmful content especially child porn and violence right. spam computer viruses all this stuff but under pressure from the left, you know, they've really taken a wrong turn and started kind of, uh, you know, accepting these requests to moderate or block content based on whether it's true or false, which inevitably leads to a question, is it just that somebody disagrees with the content? You know, how do you decide if it's true or false when you have two academic, you know, writers or two people from different viewpoints disagreeing about something? You know, I would like to be the decider of what's true and false. You know, how did we end up with a, you know, kind of a liberal media fact checker from the Washington Post or CNN gets to be the decider on, on behalf of a monopoly so, social media network like YouTube or, or, or Facebook. So whether it's something is just a disagreement or a debate or whether it's somehow it's important 
to decide if something's true or false. We believe at our Institute for Better and In It that the better test is not whether something is true or false, but the better test is whether it's imminently harmful or not. Is it imminently harmful to a person, a group of persons? And this dramatically simplifies and reduces the problem for these companies, but it also eliminates the tendency and the opportunity to censor perfectly non-harmful content based on disagreeing about it, you know, because I have a different political viewpoint or a different scientific, you know, viewpoint. Mm -hmm. What, what, just following up on, on all of that, what trends are you seeing in terms of online censorship right now? So, uh, interestingly, very recently, Twitter seems to have actually led the others to reduce their censorship of political speech. Facebook, Google, and, and some others have followed uh, Elon Musk and Twitter's lead, but quietly laid off thousands of content moderator positions mm -hmm. and shifted more to rely on AI and algorithms to moderate content. I think, you know, they may have concluded that just continuing to follow left-wing new censorship, especially in the lead up to 2024, may not be good for their business or for their PR, you know, kind of reputation. There, there still is rampant censorship, uh, particularly on certain topics. You know, for example, YouTube is still censoring openly any medical content that doesn't conform to the WHO. You know, the WHO is a flawed political organization of the United Nations that you know suffers the same political pressures as every other political you know government run organization. Um, some of these platforms are still censoring information on climate science uh, that doesn't conform to maybe what we might think of as climate alarmism, um, or just because it doesn't help the government promote their efforts on massive spending or to, to kill off you know, the energy industry before new green technologies might be ready. Uh, even this week, uh, we read that Biden has canceled, uh, you know, whatever is left of the Alaska, um, you know, the energy uh, reserves out there, the, the leases and, and ability to explore for energy. And uh, I forget what it's called, the, the, the parts of Alaska where the federal government still owns the land. And, and Google today, they, they, if you read the rules, they describe that um, search results are based partly on reputation scores of the news sites or the media where they, you know, where the results come from. And their reputation scores tend to be longer running mainstream media sources. And that, so that means they discriminate against younger, more right of center uh, sources. I, I spoke a few months ago with a former very senior executive at Google who described, he said, Mike, we get an absolute fire hydrant sized torrent of requests from left wing media, left wing academics, more recently from the government, you know, to please uh, remove content that they don't like, as opposed to really a trickle from the right, suggesting they remove content from the left they don't like. And they they, as, as a management team, they proactively try to lean to the right, but if they recognize it inevitably, whenever they make any accommodation to these requests, they are kind of shifting more and more toward the left, but it, it's simply because they're just dealing with this torrent of, of requests coming.